Chapter 76, Cohabitation, 1. There was once a small settlement situated in a rustic mountain valley in the northwestern part of the empire. It housed about 100 households, and Garrick was born and raised in that village. As a young rural man, he led an ordinary greedless life. He preferred one night's bread over gold and silver treasures and a glass of wheat beer with his friends after farm work over careers and titles. Garrick was once again reminded of the magical tsunami that took it all away. No, the tragedy that buried his village was still fresh in his mind. He could never forget the deathly screams that echoed ceaselessly amid that painful night, the cold moans amid the waves, the lightning that fell upon their lands, the thunderous pounding of his heart. The skins of the drowned turning blue. Raging tidal waves and torrents engulfed his entire village, submerging his family, neighbors, cousins, friends, and lovers. The Euclide family caused the tragedy in the name of demon hunting. Their entire settlement was reduced into a lake during that hellish night, leaving him the only survivor. But Garrick didn't feel lonely. As he peered into the deep bottom of the lake, he felt a sense of fullness within his body. The personalities of his eleven family members had appeared in his mind. The Euclide might have destroyed his home, but the souls of those he held dear continued to live in his body. However, so, was the pain of drowning tolerable? Decolain's voice brought back the agony of the past, obliterating Garrick's reasoning. Dark cries echoed from his soul. He once more relived their watery screams as they sank to their deaths. Crazy bastard. Arlos hid in the dark as she watched the scene. Imprisoned in the barrier, Decolain pointed his gun at his own temple and smiled as he glared at Garrick. His expression alone despised and humiliated his opponent. Second. Click. He pulled the trigger. No bullet was fired, but threatening mana erupted from Garrick's body. Open your eyes, Garrick. Decolain constantly provoked him. A hostage trying to take his own life was certainly an outrageous act, but it worked against him nonetheless. Garrick wanted him to die by his hands and his hands alone. Hence, he would never allow anyone to kill him except himself. Not even Decolain himself. Decolain. Garrick called his name. His gaze and tone were filled with evil and poison, but Decolain simply kept his lips twisted upward while facing him like an innocent puppy. Right. The head of the family that submerged your village is right in front of you. Was the professor really willing to die to ensure the altar bastards wouldn't get their hands on his runes? Arlos was left with no choice. Garrick. Don't be fooled. That revolver is fake. Zukakin murmured calmly, thoroughly analyzing D. Kalane with his magic-accustomed eyes. Is it? I'll have to shoot to find out. Unwaveringly, he put his finger on the trigger once more. I believe in my luck. He fired. The sound of a gunshot rang, overshadowing his confidence. D. Kalane fell, spattering blood all over the place as the deafening sound repeated like echoes. The entire lot grew so quiet not even the sounds of their breathing could be heard. Both Zukakin and Arlos found themselves perplexed. What is this? Was he dead? That barrier prevented them from gathering detailed information about his situation, but at least they felt no interference from magic or mana. Regardless, D. Kalain was a wizard, not a knight. It would have been difficult for him to withstand the lethality of bullets. No. His well-being wasn't their biggest concern right now. That no longer mattered to Garrick, after all. Well, I didn't think this operation would be easy anyway, Zukakin mumbled. In his descent to madness, Garrick's body black mana covered his body like armor, and, abandoning his humanity to turn into a dark monster, he began destroying the area around them. All sorts of magic radiated from his mouth, hands, and feet, enabling him to obliterate their vicinity. Zukakin's subordinates, the wizards and altar officers monitoring the operation, and Arlos's puppets were all torn apart by the wild beast Garrick turned into. His kicks crushed the pavement, and his nails broke the ceiling in half. Like a magic cannon, from his mouth blasted forth a breath, a devastating beam of light that imbued this underground lot even deeper into the earth. The only thing that remained intact in that hell was D. Kalane's barrier. Arlos, having escaped from her puppet and returned to her main body, looked around the basement in silence. Crackling, remnants of flames continued to burn on the crushed pavement. D. Kalane had been reduced into a corpse within the barrier, 
and Garrick remained worn out in the midst of it. He has no pulse. No vitals. She looked at their supposed hostage. His heart and his pulse had both stopped beating. She sighed and, approaching Garrick, growled afterward. You idiot. You give me too much work. Thanks to this damn maniac, all of her puppets had been smashed, leaving her with no other choice but to come using her main body. Arlos carried him since, due to his tall and skinny build, he wasn't that heavy. However, as she was about to leave, she felt someone moving behind her. A grotesque chill clawed up her spine at the same time, nearly making her tremble. Glancing sideways, Arlo saw a man slowly rising back to his feet. I'm a bit dizzy. That voice shook her consciousness. Huh? Dika Lane. His cold eyes, like a gemstone, stared at her. Arlos. When he called her name, she instinctively took a step back, widening the gap between them. Give me Garrick. What are you going to do with him? Killing him would be convenient. Dika Lane calmly answered, his tone mocking her for asking a question that could be answered by common sense alone. But Arlo shook her head. I won't give him away. Her motive wasn't as glamorous as comradeship. She wanted to protect Garrick simply because his existence was the material she needed to ultimately complete her puppetry in the future. Dika Lane shrugged. I can't help him. Arlos's mana took shape, creating a blue blade that illuminated the basement as it aimed for Dika Lane. As she prepared for combat, he continued in a strange way. I can only allow him to be brought with us. She frowned. His decision was based on simple logic. He knew he couldn't defeat her by force, after all. His head was spinning as well. What do you mean? Let's go home together. He dismantled the barrier like it was nothing then passed by Arlos, who was carrying Garrick. Whoa! The basement collapsed the moment the barrier disappeared, but he made a passage with, psychokinesis, for them. She followed him skeptically. How did you survive? You didn't even use magic. I was certain your pulse stopped. Controlling my body is easy, he answered vaguely. As soon as he reached above ground, he immediately found her vehicle, a luxury car comparable to a Mercedes-Benz in modern times. You're driving. Put Garrick in the trunk. Temporarily following his orders, Arlo slid into the driver's seat as Dika Lane took the back seat. Hmm. She looked at him in the rearview mirror. His posture, expression, and clothes remained all elegant and relaxed, which was surprisingly noble for a bastard who just committed suicide. Let's go. Do you think I'm your secretary? She clicked her tongue as she began driving. As they exited the darkness and reached the smooth pavement at the edge of the empire, Arlos asked, is asking him about the pain of drowning despite knowing his past really something a human should do? Dika Lane only smiled. He used the bad relationship between Garrick and the Euclid family to bring him the outcome he desired. It wasn't as bad as it sounded. Kim Woojin knew how to clear the quest in such a way that would save Garrick from the terrible chaos he would have faced otherwise. Did you leave the ring you bought at the auction at home? Grinning, Arlos nodded. Since he had seen her main body, she had nothing left to hide. It'll look good on you. For some reason, Dika Lane's words kept scratching her nerves. It was as if there was a hidden meaning behind them. Through his, overawe and grace, characteristic, he made people anxious and feel smaller. Please stop. Not long after, some knights blocked the road ahead of them. As Arlos brought the car to a halt, a man approached. Open your window and show your I.D. As he peered into the driver's seat, his eyes widened, finding Dika Lane in the back seat. Professor Dika Lane? Dika Lane nodded, and the knight roared. He's here. The professor's here. The moment he yelled, Arlo saw a gigantic man standing up slowly beyond the car's windshield. What? Professor Dika Lane? The Freyden family head, Sight von Brugong Freyden. The moment his monstrous physique appeared, Arlos's hair stood. He was the knight who traumatized her four years ago, is that so? Thud. 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 His gigantic strides required others to take three steps to match his speed. Sight approached like a ghost or a grim reaper, his white hair waving due to the wind. Professor Dika Lane. He lowered the front seat window with his hand, then pushed his face in and looked at Dika Lane and Arlos alternately. Who is this mysterious woman? 
I came running when I received a report that you had been kidnapped. Were you having an affair all along? The moment he raised an eyebrow, she sensed her own end. One word from D. Cullain here. And her head would be crushed like a watermelon by its sight's fist. That snake-like bastard's come all the way here. All she could do was stare at him in the rearview mirror and blame herself for hastily following his will. Is this an affair? Sight asked. Arlos had always contemplated whether she was a puppet or the main body, however, she had never hoped so desperately to be a puppet as she did this time. D. Cullain, however, replied. She doesn't fit my standards. Uttered something strange for the second time today. She's just a passerby I met on the way. She heard his words loud and clear, but it took some time for her to understand them. A passerby? Sight asked for clarification. Yes. Her car passed by chance, so I asked her to accompany me. Arlos couldn't understand his intentions, but before he said anything else, he got out of the car. Now that you're here, I may let her go. Oh oh ho. She's a beautiful woman, though. It would be a shame to send her away like this. It looks like some of our knights are already in love. At sight's words, Arlos simply smiled bitterly. That crazy 2 meters 10 centimeters bastard. Hey! open the way. The knight soon cleared the road, allowing her to drive away slowly. As she did, she looked at D. Cullain, who was reflected in the side mirror. He was looking back at her. After five minutes. Arlos pulled over to the side for a moment and glanced at the seat where D. Cullain had been sitting, holding her breath. There she found a letter and a crystal ball. She looked at the letter first. Are you aware, Arlos? Although chaos cannot know its shape, that doesn't mean it is an evil existence. Garrick must also be part of that chaos, so I'll leave him to you. Find a better way to deal with him than killing him. Think of this crystal ball as a link between you and me. I think we can be good partners. As she read his handwriting, she narrowed her eyes at it. What does he want? At that moment, she finally felt relieved of the tension that had caused her entire body to tighten up. Psychologically, it was the first time since sight that someone pushed her this far. Sharing the same space, a moment, with D. Cullain was a burden in itself. I can't figure that guy out. It felt like she was being pulled into the abyss. It was as if amid his overflowing aristocratic dignity, a monster whose size couldn't even be estimated was waiting for prey with its mouth wide open. Not long after, she found a hawk perched on a branch and staring at her. It was a well-made familiar spirit. I heard there was a report of a kidnapping. Did that guy report it? The moment their gazes met, the bird quickly flew away. Arlo stepped on the accelerator. My plan was simple. After reconstructing the barrier to make it as sturdy as possible, I would provoke Garrick, and while he violently raged around me, I would escape. To that end, I put my faith in my, Iron Man, and a technique that weakened bullets even a bit. I had no doubts about the former's performance but that was the first time I learned how powerful a revolver truly was. Had I not woven very faint mana into its muzzle, I could have died. I didn't want to get shot again. After that, I artificially lowered the speed of my blood flow by using, Iron Man, once more. That allowed me to fall into a near-death state where my heart dangled ever so close to stopping. Even Garrick, the man-eating bear whose rage had swallowed him, wouldn't touch a corpse with many lived beings around him. Do you feel dazed or have a headache, Professor? It was already 8 a.m. The case I was involved in was finally over. I could finally enjoy a peaceful morning filled with the melodic chirping of birds. I don't. I pushed the doctor away, who was trying to diagnose my head. I didn't want to expose my, Iron Man, body. Still, it would be better to get a proper diagnosis. Lilia Premien said, observing my checkup. I was currently at the head office of the Public Safety Bureau, Equilium. Deputy Director Premien brought me here in the name of protection and investigation. I'll be fine in a day. Her Majesty also seems concerned, considering she sent her servants here. She shrugged and stepped away. An imperial courtier then appeared behind her and handed me a sealed letter. Premien murmured. I think she likes you a lot. I'm jealous. Likes? As I stared at her, she coughed and avoided my gaze. The servant then said, Your Majesty wants you to read it right away. Okay. I broke the seal, 
finding only two lines. How can someone who calls himself my teacher get kidnapped? If this happens again, you'll have to be prepared to be dismissed from employment. As I put the letter in my pocket, the servant spoke. Moreover, as per Her Majesty's will, an escort knight will be assigned to you to protect you. An escort knight? Yes. Her Majesty's decided that you are worthy of being classified as an individual important enough to be granted national protection for the next three months. Premien helped deliver the servant's message. That's right. Runes are such powerful magic that many evils are coveting them. In fact, the latest incident was somewhat predictable. If you predicted it, wouldn't you have prevented it? Shouldn't you leave now? Yes. Then, I'll be going. The imperial courtier bowed and left. I sighed, feeling my head suddenly ache. It would be an insult to the imperial family if I say I don't need it. That's right, Premien replied, causing me to stare at her. Strangely enough, I found every word she uttered disturbing. I'm going. If you leave now, you'll find yourself in a bit of trouble. Don't worry. I ignored her words and stood up. I still felt a bit dizzy, but I'd recover soon anyway. Riding the elevator in the hallway, Premien, who followed me to guide me, pressed the first floor button. Ding. Exiting the machinery and reaching the lobby, I swiftly came to understand what she meant about finding myself in a bit of trouble if I left now. Ah. Professor. Are you okay? Thank God. You don't know how worried I was. How dare some coward do that to you? Instead of ministers, many merchants and entrepreneurs gathered in the reception area. Pretending to be concerned, they asked the information they wanted most seemed to be the contents of Emperor Sophine's letter. Thank you for your concern. Now, everyone, I'll have to excuse myself. I answered appropriately and headed out. In the parking lot, I found Roy waiting with a new car. Master. Are you okay? I'm fine. Don't worry. That's fortunate. I went to the back seat of the car. As I sat down, I noticed something strange. The seat next to me wasn't empty. Looking at the person occupying it, I found a knight in light armor. What are you doing here? Was I in the wrong car? I tilted my head, and the knight, sitting still, said, I'm on a mission. What mission? Only then did the knight turn to me, her eyes reflecting me. I am Professor D. Cullane's escort knight. Julie. Her words made me speechless. At that moment, I imagined the emperor smiling mischievously. All I could do was sigh. Clack. The passenger's door opened not long after. Uriel came in. I'm here. Can you tell me what happened, huh? As soon as she sat down, she abruptly stopped speaking and looked at Julie with surprise in her eyes instead. Who are you? Uriel. You? Her eyebrows furrowed. Julie answered, starting today, I'm Professor D. Cullane's escort knight. Escort knight? Yes. Her Majesty herself assigned this task to me. No, seriously, what are you talking about? Uriel's face distorted. Uriel thought about asking what happened. She even thought about asking if he had any injuries. However, what dawned upon her was nothing short of a nonsensical reality. Looking at him, it seemed as though nothing really happened. She even found it funny how he was finally acting like a brother to her. Even though he had given up his position as the family head, that didn't mean their relationship had been restored. In fact, at this moment, she thought she had learned his reason for doing so to some extent. Julie. It was probably because of that girl. Through the rearview mirror, Uriel glared at Julie, the knight guarding him like a stone statue. She was too sincere and serious. TSK. Sometimes, she found herself wondering how such a dull, rigid, and savvy woman could capture the insensitive and sharp D. Cullane. However, she just couldn't understand why he fell in love with her. Since you're his escort, does that mean you're going to be staying in his mansion as well? Yes. What? That startled her. On the other hand, in her official execution mode, Julie remained emotionless and firm. This is the first order issued to the private knight since Her Majesty took the throne. This mission will remain active for three months, and we must stay near him until then. Why do you have to be in his mansion, though? Her Majesty ordered it herself. I would appreciate it if you could give me the smallest room. My home is too far from my protectee. If I were to stay there, 
I wouldn't be able to ascertain his safety. That's absurd. In the past, even when I asked you if we could live together, you hastily refused. What is this? D. Cullain swiftly replied. Uriel, be quiet. Aren't we members of the same family? This is ridiculous. She softly muttered as she looked out the window, finding a certain hawk in the sky seemingly circling around the vehicle they were in. Is that one chasing us? Nothing seemed to go in Uriel's favor that day. Chapter 77, Cohabitation, 2. The Altar, a secret society aiming to resurrect the god who died in ancient times, was based in a sanctuary at the fear east of the continent, where new life didn't grow. They dedicated their lives solely to the return of the fallen god, their purpose, never doubting their beliefs and faith. To that end, they were willing to sacrifice even their own lives. This was caused by the intermediary that brought them together, a dream. It came down like a revelation to them one day. Believers each received the same grace and moved to the attainment of the same goal. As fanatics of God's calling, they cultivated a proud religion for his future advent, God. That was why the altar wanted D. Cullain's runes. Their deity wanted the knowledge in his head. He appeared in their dreams and directly appointed them to that task. Is that professor walking a different path from his father? However, D. Cullain rejected the altar's offer. It was a completely different attitude from the previous Euclid head. Feats and honor. The factors their family held as their priority had to have been those two. I'm not sure. I don't even know if he wants to monopolize the runes. It doesn't matter. We need them. If we learn the language of the runes, we'll gain the ability to communicate with him. With that knowledge, more devout service was possible, which in turn could accelerate his advent. Let's keep an eye on the professor. We need the information he has, and he won't be able to refuse to negotiate forever. For now, contact the demon-blooded people. The altar found D. Cullain's actions strange. They didn't know why he defended those who carried demon blood in their veins. He could have just done that out of human intentions, but they had no way to know. All they could do was use that fact thoroughly. Got it. The Empire was already aware of their organization's existence. The officials were happily taking bribes right now, but they knew they thought of them as nutcases deep down. Thus, the altar knew what they had to say. We defend the demon-blooded people as well. That one line would suffice. The rest was up to those who hadn't been swallowed by madness. Euclid Mansion. Sight, wearing a suit, was waiting in the front yard garden that Julie and I came to. Oh. You're here he approached us with a smile. Professor D. Cullain. It's nice to see you again. You too, Julie. I'm on a mission right now. Please refrain from speaking privately. Julie gave her big brother a serious look, to which sight simply skimmed over before looking at my car. Whoa. That's new. It's big enough even for me to ride. I like the car you had before more, though. Is that so? Yeah. I mean, this one's weird. Its design seems more advanced and modern. Perhaps it was because, Midas's hand, hadn't been used on it yet. Sight's five senses could clearly discern even the faintest attribute, after all. That aside, I heard you met the altar members. His voice grew as sharp as a dagger, his gaze as focused as a beast. Yes. They wanted my knowledge about the runes. The altar gradually revealed itself to the player as they played the game, but the named characters already knew of them. Some were cooperative enough with them to make deals with them and accept their bribes, but many, like Sight, despised such an organization with every fiber of their being. I knew they would. It wouldn't hurt to tear their jaws apart with my bare hands and drag out their intestines. You'll break the car. Uriel tapped his hand as he rubbed the window sill unknowingly, causing him to back away laughing. Oh. I'm sorry. I sometimes forget the strength my body holds. This is why cars can't be used on the battlefield. If I push them just a bit, they easily get sent flying. The car isn't the problem here. It's your physique. Is it? Oh, sister-in-law, is this car brand new? I'm not an in-law yet, but yes. It is. Whoa. How much was it? Sight looked pleased. Uriel replied, 300,000 Elnus. Do you want to buy one? If it's your request, you wouldn't have to draw a numbered ticket. Ha ha ha. No, thanks. 
That's expensive. He laughed, causing her to pout. More importantly, will you be staying for the night today too? No. Now that I've confirmed it's the altar's doing, I'm done here. If I stay, I might get in the way of your dating business. He raised an eyebrow slyly, to which Julie growled like an enraged tiger. Oh, speaking of business, I heard you've also started one yourself, Uriel. Come on. Why did you have to say that? Uriel glanced at me. She probably thought I didn't know about it. On the contrary, however, as soon as she started the business, ran an and immediately reported it to me. Uriel. Cold sweat formed on her temple. Sight scratched the back of his neck, expressing his embarrassment. I guess you decided to create it on your own, huh? I'll just go tilde. As the giant white bear left, she glared at him while grinding her teeth. Uriel. The weather is nice today. Answer me. I mean, that's. Um. A car business is a bit better than carriages. After stuttering for a moment, she changed her strategy in no time, becoming as blunt as she usually was. What? It's fancier, and I thought it would be nice to have such a factory in our family's name. The cars the people in Brunhill make are also extremely cheap. They came to me, saying bullshit like, I'll give you the car for D. Colain, but your car is over-reserved, Miss Uriel. Can you believe that? She let out a sigh and tapped her chest, then slowly looked up at my face. So, I'm saying I'm going to make some cars. There are many mines in our factory's vicinity to supply it with materials. Go for it. I don't know why you only thought of starting this now. Her jaw dropped at that moment. That expression of hers alone told me what she was thinking. Manufacturing business is something only lowly beings do. Something like that. There's a guy suitable for that job at the hardware store I invested in. I'll send him to Haiti Kane, and I'll make the design today. Start with that. A hardware store? You? Me? As I narrowed my eyes at her, Uriel covered her mouth. I'll be going, then. She left hastily. In response to Julie's request for the smallest room, I gave her the smallest room at the mansion. However, since it was literally a room to welcome guests, it had facilities including a toilet, bathroom, and a dressing room. You can use this. It's two. This is the smallest room we have. Don't look down on the Euclines hospitality. I wouldn't tolerate anything below this level of comfort for my guests. Okay. Julie put her luggage on the bed silently. Huh. You didn't strike me as an old-fashioned woman. I smiled as I looked at what she bought. In this era where handbags, backpacks, and even suitcases had been invented, she brought a bundle wrapped in cloth. Oh. Even if it looks like that, it is a magical item. It's equivalent to two to three bags. I bought it really cheap four years ago. Her voice was full of pride. Seeing her smile, I thought she was reminded of the moment she bought it. I used my amazing bargaining skills back then. The merchant offered 5,000 illness, and I. I'm not interested. Does the execution of official duties last 24 hours a day? Yes. Evenings are the most dangerous time of each day. I doubt their attacks would stop after just one attempt. I agree, but the second one could be a year later. If we're going to be together all year, we should just get married. The official length of this mission is only three months. She opened her bundle while avoiding my eyes. Certainly, there were quite a few things in it. Take this. I held out a crystal ball the size of a coin. Julie tilted her head. What is it? A crystal ball linked to the barrier of this mansion. If an intruder comes, you'll be the first to know. It's also imbued with a communication function, so you can always talk to the security team in the basement. Oh, there are so many amazing things in this world. She nodded and tried to take it, but I withdrew it before she could. However, you are too clumsy. What? What do you mean? How am I clumsy? Julie's eyebrows furrowed. I softened my golden tie pins and turned them into a necklace, then threaded it with the crystal ball. Afterward, I tried to hang it around her neck. Surprised, she made a gesture of resistance but soon accepted my advances as soon as she heard my reasoning. You said you lost the ring I gave you last time. Rather than losing it, she most likely threw it away. I smiled, but my face soon hardened. 
Why did I have this memory? I. Misunderstanding my expression, she bowed her head without a word. I was a bit disconcerted, so I just tapped her on the shoulder and walked out. Leaning against the hallway's wall, I ruffled my hair. It's clear. I slid a ring onto Julie's finger, which she didn't want to receive, so forcibly that it looked like I almost broke her finger. She just kept her mouth shut throughout the process, but her eyes were welling up with tears. These memories weren't mine, but they felt as if they were. Gosh. I knocked and opened the door to her room again, finding her in the middle of unpacking. She looked back at me with a slumped posture. W what? She left her luggage half unpacked on her bed, a stuffed doll among them. Hmm. When my gaze fell on it, Julie let out a little squeal. She grabbed the panda's head and hid it behind her back. It's for L luck. It's like a jinx, a jinx. Each night has one, this is the key to your room. Always keep it locked. I might come in unannounced otherwise. As I gave her the key, Julie's face turned red, but her expression remained nightly and solemn while she received it. Thank you. Or, should I also hang this key around your neck? I, it's okay. It's okay. Now get out. Julie pushed my back, and after being kicked out, I stood in the hallway smiling. Humph. The sound of dissatisfaction soon pierced my ears like needles. I turned around, finding Uriel. You're enjoying this so much didn't you go back already? What? You told me you'd be making the design. Design? Car design. Oh, right. Follow me. I nodded and walked down the hallway with her, who kept whispering to herself. Her smile made me feel disgusted, almost as if I was looking at a curved centipede. However, I hoped she would smile like that a lot more frequently. You're noisy. I went to the library, took out a piece of paper and a fountain pen, and drew a design based on my modern knowledge and, aesthetic sense. It was by no means a blueprint since I only designed it. I left its technical parts to the nerds. Take it. Why are there two? One's a car, and the other's a watch. A watch? Why a watch? She glanced at my waist. Your pocket watch is still in good condition. If you're not planning on using it anymore, can I have it? Leave it to my hardware store clerk. They will do well. HMPF. Well then. As she turned around with the designs in her arms, Uriel stopped. Can I really start a business, though? You're not going to say something weird about this again later on, are you? No, but if you fail, you'll be caned. Who said I would let you? She gave me a piercing gaze then went out of the study. The next day, I went to work at the tower and submitted my plans for the final exam. It's pretty ordinary? The chairman's eyes widened as soon as she looked at the documents. It's very different from your last test. Is there a problem with that? Not really, no, but. It probably won't have the same ripple effect as last time. It won't be as ordinary as you think. She put the plan in the drawer with a dissatisfied expression on her face, then pulled out another document. Oh, right. I've checked your first ever approved project as the planning and financial coordination head. I see. It costs a lot of money. The initial fund it's asking for is 10 million illness, which is crazy. It will result in an excellent return of investment. The chairman glared at me with slightly narrowed eyes but soon muttered, it's your responsibility anyway. And got up. Good. Now then. Come with me. Let's take a look at Julie, your bodyguard. As expected, you already know. What do you mean as expected? The rumors have already spread all over the empire. I went into the elevator with her. As we arrived on the first floor, we found Julie waiting. Several Freyhem knights were most likely also deployed to certain points around me. Oh. Knight Julie. You look beautiful today. She didn't answer. I explained the reason to the confused chairman. They don't speak during official duties. At that moment, the chairman smiled slyly. Is that so? She turned around, stood next to Julie, and, after warming up her mouth with a cough. It's been a long time Julie. Nice to see you again. It's been two weeks. Started talking non-stop. If this happened in the past you would have rejected this mission. Even though it's in the emperor's name you wouldn't have stepped forward on your own. You took it now though. Even the world finds it amazing. 
rumors went around so fast. Is it okay to say that you two have now completely reconciled? No I think you already did. If so will the marriage proceed as planned this time around? This is amazing. They say silence means you agree with it. You must have been very worried about the professor. To escort him personally like this, gosh. My ears are going to explode. I laughed silently at Julie's cry. The final exam would start next week. Because of that, the atmosphere of the entire university, including the Knights Department, grew extremely tense. The library was filled with people, and the restaurant, which used to close at 9 p.m., kept its services open around the clock. The wizards ceaselessly studied for self-improvement and for their exams while also peeking at the opportunity to keep others in check. Anyway. Today, the final exams for Dika Lane's, Understanding Pure Elements, class would be announced. The value of the final exam of a five-credit lecture was obviously high. Hence, Efarin decided to go to the classroom 30 minutes before the announcement. Whoa! Seemingly thinking like her, 140 out of 150 of the class population were already present. Sitting down, she decided to study while waiting. At exactly 3 o'clock in the afternoon, Assistant Professor Allen came in. Nobody could claim he wasn't Head Professor D. Cullane's assistant at this point. Nice to meet you. This paper is an overview of the final exam. Everyone will be given a copy. You must be careful not to lose it smiling, he began handing the document out. What kind of test will it be this time? Phew. Affairing took a deep breath and looked at its contents. As soon as she did, she blinked. After turning it over, she looked at the other debutantes. It was a natural reaction. All of them in the classroom were behaving like a fairing. You're dismissed. The final exam will start on Monday in three weeks. Alan left them with those words, but a fairing's doubts remained. She became even more confused since the assistant professor, who was supposed to solve her doubts, had already exited the room. What is this? A fairing muttered, staring at the paper. There was literally nothing in it. Sylvia came out of the tower and, looking at the paper she was given, pondered about it. No matter how she looked at it, it remained empty. It was just plain white paper. It left her wondering what she should do with it. The assistant professor told them not to lose it, which could be a clue in itself, but was this paper really that important? Could this be the test itself? As she walked in silence, Sylvia stumbled upon the nepotistic cheeky stupid idiot affairing. She was lying on the lawn and looking at her paper. Holding it high in the sky, she turned it vertically then horizontally, the sun's rays remaining reflected on it. Seemingly finding no answer, she grabbed it then trembled, almost as if she had been electrocuted. Stupid. Sylvia twisted her lips contemptuously while attempting to pass by her, but she soon had a sudden thought. Should I tear hers apart? That might cause a fairing to be eliminated. Forget it. Sylvia shook her head. There was no guarantee that ripping her paper would unconditionally benefit her. Even if there was, she didn't want to even think of doing anything that wasn't noble. At that moment, however. Rivip. The sound of paper being torn apart startled her. She didn't know who did it, but it was certainly a surprise. Hayua? When she looked over at a fairing, she found her paper neatly cut in half. Her eyes grew so wide they looked like they were about to pop out. Sylvia laughed involuntarily. Um. Ah. Uh. As if trying to deny reality, a fairing squeaked with only her mouth open. Who did thigh fives? In an instant, her behavior turned into that of a provoked wild boar. What kind of? Sylvia found her yells both funny and pitiful. What kind of mean basta aired? She should have known better than to sit near the tower and flaunt her paper out in the open. After all, wizards were cold-blooded individuals that would dig into their target's weaknesses far quicker and far. More brutal than any other. Sighing, Sylvia walked over to the idiot. The editors and translators have forwarded some notes with this chapter and I've rewritten and condensed it below. Alan is a male assistant professor. However, from chapters 30 to 31, in the train assault arc, D. Lane felt that his hand felt odd, etc., and had noticed other clues in their day-to-day. -day. Alan's true gender is female. Basically, going forward, if it's in the perspective of D. Lane, first-person POV, 
Alan is referred to as a female since he knows her true gender. However, if it's anyone else referring to her, or if in a dialogue between people, she is referred to as a male since they themselves don't know her identity. As of late, the nuance of the way D. Colleen has been talking to Alan could infer that she is a female, which is why we've gone ahead and changed the pronouns. That and the fact that this ain't no BL novel, boys, your boy actives got you. What makes this super confusing is that the Korean language literally doesn't use gender pronouns, so in addition to the author's superb fantasy world naming sense, his complicated writing style, the nondescriptive nature of Korean fiction, namely, with character descriptions, having multiple soul puppets with different genders from their host, and now a character disguised in the opposite gender, it's been hard to be completely accurate. The only way for us to do so is to read 20 to 50 chapters ahead for context, which is impossible with our current budget. Anyways, we might add a few sentences in the earlier chapters to localize and provide context to the transition of the pronouns over time. Chapter 78, Mask, 1. Pig's Flower, a famous restaurant near the Imperial University. I'll kill him. Sylvia stared at her fellow debutante, finding how she exploded in rage while ripping the rohawk apart. Funny. I'll find him and kill him no matter what. She hadn't found who tore apart her paper yet, and perhaps she would never know. There were so many people nearby at the time. Stupid affairing. Turning her head, she glared at Sylvia, bitter tears welling up in her fierce eyes. You won't be able to do anything even if you knew who did it. Your paper won't revert to its original state. Did you come to mock me? Laughing disdainfully, Sylvia pulled out her own paper, making a fairing envious. Wung. Sylvia's barrier wrapped around the dining table. Assistant Professor Allen told us not to lose this paper, but she didn't tell us the exam location. Did you figure something out? No. Not yet. How was this paper related to what they had learned so far? Although it was dodgy, Sylvia believed in D. Colleen and his lectures. If you haven't figured out anything yet. Lightly glancing at her, Efferin hesitantly brought up a proposal. D. Do you want to team up? We did the group project together anyway. You remember, right? Stupid Efferin. W. What? I'll be a great help. I'm second only to you, you know. She put the piece of Rohawk down which clearly showed how desperate she was. Nevertheless, Sylvia shook her head. You don't have a paper. I do. Who doesn't know that? Perhaps cases like you will be more frequent. We do still have three weeks for the exam. Sigh. I want to cry. She sniffed and pulled a handkerchief from her pocket. Trying to look pitiful, she wiped tears off her eyes, but Sylvia was far too focused on the cloth she took out to notice. Sylvia recalled the handkerchief D. Colleen gave her, which she then used to decorate her panda with. The pattern it had was the same as the one in Efferin's hands. You. Her body moved on its own, hurriedly grabbing Efferin's wrist, making her flinch. W what? Where did you get this? This H handkerchief? Yeah. That's a secret. Efferin firmly shook her head, but Sylvia, surprisingly, insisted. Tell me. Why should I? Efferin frowned. Why did she care about it? Was it because the handkerchief was too luxurious? Whoa, is this a luxury treasure even the Iliade family can't easily get? If you tell me, I might let you join me in the exam. I'll buy you Rohawks during the test period. That made Efferin think. Her sponsor's identity was anonymous anyway. It wouldn't be a betrayal if she just told her that she was sponsored. It really wasn't because of the free Rohawk. Maybe it was, but just a little. However, she had to keep her grades up if she wanted to see her sponsor's face. A fairing glanced at Sylvia. I didn't steal it. Do you believe me? If you didn't, then where did you get it? She answered shortly after hesitating a bit. It's a gift from a sponsor. Sponsor? Sylvia's eyebrows scrunched as she clenched her hand hidden under the table. Yeah. I received a sponsorship. I didn't even know I would. You're sponsored. Yes I didn't even think I could get one. That's all I know, though. It's an anonymous sponsorship. I think it would be disrespectful to dig into it. Why did you suddenly ask, though? Did you see this handkerchief somewhere? Efferin's eyes were widening with curiosity, 
and Sylvia's eyes narrowed. No. It just doesn't suit you. Gosh. Anyway, I told you what I know, so we're doing it together, right? Sylvia cut the meat in front of her without saying anything as she looked into her face intently. Her expression was as vague as always, revealing nothing that was in her mind. She didn't even smile. Her stiff, mask-like face was initially unpleasant to look at, but... I'll accept your silence as your approval, okay? Now, it wasn't as bad. A fairing began to cheer up. Sylvia looked at her, seemingly out of spite, as she put a piece of meat into her mouth. Julie held a cup of coffee in a cafe near the tower. From now to midnight, D. Cullane had to check a thesis in the lab. It was a momentary break. No matter how strong of a gut they had, the altar wouldn't commit a kidnapping in the university tower, and she knew better than to interfere in Professor D. Cullane's personal time to study. Time flies so fast. Looking at the campus outside the window reminded her of the old days. If she walked a little further, she'd find the Knights Training Center. A bit further than that, and she'd stumble upon the Knights Square, and even further, the grand main building of the Imperial Order. The Imperial Order, which all knights on the continent regarded as a dream. She had a history of working in that hall of fantasy, but now it was all in the past. She couldn't go back, and she couldn't turn time around. Julie. Her eyes immediately looked in the direction where she heard her name coming from. So you were here. At the cafe's entrance, she found Gwen, Raphael, and Sirio, smiling at her as they approached her. Did you come to observe the night's exams? Julie asked. Huh? Yeah, that too. The encounter made Julie happy, but Gwen scratched the back of her neck, looking apologetic. Well, I don't have much to say. Here. Take it. She gave her a letter, the imperial seal on it surprising her. Oh. This is about the mission from last time, isn't it? Yeah, but I think you're on a different task now. It's fine. This one involves Professor D. Cullane too. At Julie's words, Gwen looked more mysterious. She rejoiced like a child. Participating in an important mission was also one of the dreams of a true knight, but... Read it. Yep. She vigorously answered as she opened it, only for its very first sentence to destroy her expectations that had been accumulating. Non-disclosure of secrets pledge, non-disclosure of secrets? Julie looked at Gwen as if waiting for an explanation, seemingly unable to understand what it meant. Her fellow knight sighed. D. Cullane's condition for his participation is your removal from this task. What? He's doing it instead of you. Not with you. She read the letter without saying anything. Eunuch Jolang's words were more concise, which basically told her, D. Cullane is worried about his fiancée, so you're out. Just don't tell others about this mission. Julie? She remained silent for quite a long moment, looking as if she didn't know what to do. After showing a vivid expression, she gripped the letter in her hand, causing it to crumple. Is this true? Yeah. D. Cullane's the worst, isn't he? Gwen smiled bitterly. Instead of listening to her, Julie rolled her tongue in her mouth, her cheeks puffing up one at a time. It was a habit that came out whenever she was really angry. Why? D. Cullane knows about your injury, Raphael replied. Looking at him, she found him standing behind Gwen with his arms crossed. My injury? Julie asked. Gwen nodded. Yeah. He knows you haven't completely recovered yet. That you pretended to be. They said the Imperial Palace's basement is filled with mana. With your current state, joining this mission would be like walking into a sea of poison, wouldn't it? She got that injury during a mission. At the time, she almost died, but she had overcome it now. At least, that was what she had been thinking. D. Cullane eliminated you from teaching the Emperor because of that too. It seems he discovered it as soon as he felt your mana. Well, he is the head professor, after all. Gwen then continued, murmuring, he told me not to tell you, but what does he know? Screw him Tilda. Maybe he knew it would harm your career if the Imperial Palace were to learn of your predicament, so he's trying to hide it in his own way for you. And without telling you. Julie knew that all too well. Due to the nature of her injury, if it got worse, the Guardian Knight position would grow even farther away. 
Dika Lane has a reputation for disliking eunuchs, especially Zhou Lang, but he still took the mission in your stead. Well, that was only proper. You were injured because of that bastard in the first place. The relationship between the Ukline family and eunuchs couldn't be any worse. They weren't the only ones. Prestigious, high-ranking families often quarreled and argued with them, but of them all, Freyden and Ukline fought against them the hardest. Anyway, this is only until you get better. If we fail the mission, we'll wait until you get better. That would mean it would be impossible without you. Right Sirio interrupted in the back. Gwen glared at him, and he immediately stepped back, grunting. I can't even say anything. Yes. All right. I understand. Now go back. When Julie asked them to leave, Gwen and the others hesitated for a moment but followed her wish in the end. Left alone, she placed her hand below her collarbone, feeling a clear lump. Just touching it caused her to feel a burning pain. She thought she had overcome it, but it had been slowly reviving in the recent days. Did you know about it? This time too? Julie thought about De Calaine. There was a time when she couldn't estimate the size of her love for him. That huge affection tied her up and weighed down her mind. Its effects on her weren't much different from violence. That was how he pushed her. Now, however, he had definitely changed so clearly it was almost unbelievable. Of course, others said it was all acting. Rayleigh, Rockfell, and the rest said she shouldn't be fooled, it's acting. Oh. A loud voice startled her. She trembled, making her look like she was vibrating. Or is it? The University Tower chairman smiled at her. Was I talking to myself out loud? No. It's the mind-reading skill I developed. Of course, others say that he's acting, I just heard that part. Julie's eyes widened. TTH that's rude. How dare you read someone's mind. Ag. Why do you have to yell? I didn't know it would work either. You scared my baby. Your baby? Only then did Julie notice the leash in her hand, which was attached to a small, fluffy puppy. Are you okay, Orm Spartinza Adrienne too? Woof. Woof. He said he got scared. Julie just looked at the puppy blankly. Oh. Okay. Panting, it opened its mouth, smiled, and stuck its tongue out. It looked so cute she thought it'd take away her soul. The chairman, looking at her, asked, Hmm. Do you like dogs? Yes? Oh, oh, that, I do. No. No. I'm on a mission. Ha hoo. The chairman laughed and put Orm Spartinza Adrienne too on Julie's knees, causing her to blush in an instant. When the puppy barked, her stiffened face melted. However, the next moment, Julie hurriedly released her mana. Stop it. I'm serious. The chairman used her, mind reading, magic to see through her again. Gosh. I won't do it, so buy me a cup of coffee. Ah it feels like the times when I walked through this campus as a student was just yesterday. Julie pretended to be distracted. The chairman, fixing her gaze outside the window, ordered a cup of coffee herself. Tick. Tock. The clock struck midnight, but I was still checking magic in the lab. I'm stuck. The idea that Afarian's father had devised. The research I spent the longest time in this world, resulting in around 3,000 pages. A wall blocked that magic development research. I looked at the document's filled table. This magic paper filled with formulas, magic circles, operations, and logic was concrete and systematic. However, the biggest problem was that I lacked the enormous talent and mana needed to realize this idea's final knot. Of course, mana stone static mana could serve as supplements to a certain level. However, there was nothing I could do with my lack of talent. It was painful. This study required talent in all four elements. However, Dika Lane only had two elements, earth and fire. TSK. I had, Iron Man, but my head throbbed. Was it because I shot my skull with a revolver three days ago? I'm done for today. Since there wasn't much I could do about it right now, I lifted the research data with, psychokinesis, stored them all in a safe, and came out of the lab. As I was about to get in the elevator, Alan's office came into my eyes. Assistant Professor Alan. It was a small room in the corner of the 77th floor. It still had light coming from inside it. 
I approached it slowly and knocked on the door. Uck. Alan, sleeping on the desk, woke up. She looked tired. Uck. You stayed too late, water brings you out here? What? You stayed. I mean, it's. It's late, professor. Were you waiting for me? Oh. I thought it wouldn't be polite to leave first. I laughed. Alan scratched her head. Let's leave together, then. Oh, okay. Wait. I'll bring the journal. She ran somewhere. I looked around her office, finding well-organized documents, diaries she had been writing since he became an assistant, student records, syllabuses, report cards, and so on in dustless bookshelves. It was a neat and orderly room, and the air in here itself seemed clean. It could even be called a systematized warehouse, not an assistant office. But that wasn't what I thought was most important. There weren't even a bit of Alan's traces here, the owner of this place. Not even her scent or footprints. It wasn't just here. In my office and the entire university tower, her traces were carefully hidden. Perhaps it was something similar to occupational diseases. Before leaving, she erased her tracks. I didn't know what exactly her job was, though. I guess it's almost over. That made me realize. It wouldn't be long before Alan's departure. I saw a book on her desk. It was my gift, you Klein, Understanding Pure Elements, revised. It seemed like she was studying hard, but many question marks were on many of its pages. Fortunately, I found them in the second half of the book, not the basic process. Professor. Alan had returned. Please look at this. I made another one. It should be a bit better this time. The document she showed me was a list of wizards that wanted to be under my command. Although it was better than the last time, I still wasn't satisfied. Sliding the document in my pocket, I looked at her. Alan. Yes? We're now at the end of the semester. This is an important time for you too. This period was valuable and hectic for anyone in the tower. No one would show interest if someone disappeared, so there wouldn't be a better time to leave. Oh, right but I'm fine. I'm still overwhelmed with the assistant professor job. She answered with a smile. That look was all too familiar to me, but it felt a bit arrogant. How much longer did she intend to hide? How many years were you with me? Ever since you became the head professor. I see. What kind of opportunity had she been aiming for since then? Did she want to kill me or just observe me? I didn't know her purpose, but since she was about to leave, it would mean she had already fulfilled it or was about to. I wanted to know what she was thinking. I didn't see a death variable from Alan, but I knew she could just be hiding it. Josephine had also deceived my eyes before, after all. Alan. I carefully recited her name and put my hands on her shoulder. Thank you for everything. That short phrase, as if to suggest farewell, caused her eyes to widen. What? The moonlight that flowed through the window gave her expression light and dark shades. At that moment, her emotions were revealed. I saw pure surprise and sudden questions. Nothing more than that. My words were meant to test her. Well, if this were enough to reveal her true intentions, I would have caught her from the beginning. The other day, I told you that you passed the test. Oh, right. Alan placed her hand on top of each other on her chest. You told me my sincerity made me pass the test when you gave me the position of assistant professor, but you also said there was still the next phase. If the first phase was sincerity, the next is trust. Trust. When she looked like she had fallen deep in her thoughts, I put one hand on her shoulder. Alan, you got my faith. H huh? Her surprise became evident on her puffed cheeks, her hidden emotions surfacing through their redness. I can't let you, whom I trust, be an assistant forever. Does that mean? Starting next semester, I think you can be a professor. Alan's eyes welled up with tears. I didn't know which part of her was sincere or false, but it was exactly because of that that I put her on my side, adhering to a proverb I once heard before. Keep your friends close, but your enemies closer. However, if Alan turned out to be my enemy, I would be a bit disappointed, so this wasn't much different from persuading her not to be. So, I hope you trust me as well. I wiped her tears with my hand that had a glove on, leaving transparent droplets on the black leather clinging against my skin. Remain on this tower. Alan's expression sank slowly. 
I didn't know if that showed her surprise or if it simply revealed what was hidden underneath her facade. I will allow it. I didn't even have any way to know that. Nevertheless, I met her eyes as the moon hid behind the clouds. Just stay next to me. A system message covered her face. The villain's fate, death variable avoided. Acquired reward, store currency plus 2 chapter 79, mask, 2. Alan pretended to go home, but she returned to the assistant professor's office, a peaceful and cozy space on the 77th floor. There were three bookshelves to its right and a table big enough to fit a typewriter, a pencil, and a thick course book at the end. D. Cullane had already left, leaving her alone with the starlights from the sky. As she habitually swept and wiped her dark office, Alan had an unusual feeling. It was strange. Was it because she had stayed by his side for so long already? No, she noticed it relatively recently. Exhausted by D. Cullane's tyranny and paranoid perfectionism, everyone left him. Alan was the only one left. She wasn't expecting to notice anything in the first place. So it was even weirder. While she was with him, she studied magic, read books, prepared classes, and taught students. She lived like an ordinary assistant, almost as if she wanted to have this life since forever. Closing her eyes, she recalled his words. You got my faith. His voice seemed to comfort her for all her hard work. Decline said that, but he didn't know her truth. He didn't know she was far from someone he could trust. Alan wasn't even her real name. Stay by my side. Deca Lane's last request. She thought of herself answering him. Yes. Of course. She said. Alan slowly opened her eyes, muttering, looking at the distant sky. It's been a long time since I saw someone as mysterious as you. She thought it was right for him to die at first. She just considered him as a noble with a mental illness, someone unskilled that she could easily break if she moved her fingertip. But he changed, seemingly out of the blue, and showed his real side. He was always externally cold, but the warmth Alan felt from him for the first time was more brilliant than any flame she had seen. Finding it interesting, she unknowingly saved him from death. The Burke trained terrorism and Varen attack. Alan watched all of it and broke Varen's wrist herself. But, I don't think I can keep your trust. Slowly, cracks slithered through the darkness of the night. The light of dawn had revealed itself. The sun was rising. I have been on this mission for too long. There weren't many sunrises left that she could see as Alan. Before long, she would leave the world she was immersed herself in every day. She shouldn't feel sorry. She shouldn't even have such emotion. I have become familiar with Alan as well. Alan rested her forehead on the window, feeling the cold air that penetrated the room as she scrunched her nose. A sunny midsummer weekend. Julie enjoyed an uncommon laze. The subject of her mission was safe, her work as a Freyham knight was relatively easy today, and she had already finished her morning training. Whoa! She played with the attendants in the lounge of the mansion. The room was full of all kinds of advanced items and a variety of board games, but what attracted her interest the most was the object known as a radio. Isn't this a crystal ball? How does it have sounds? Oh the radio? We found it amazing when we first saw it too. I think there's a mana stone collector plate inside. I don't know the details, but basically, it has 13 channels, and depending on which frequency you set it to, you'll be able to hear what's broadcasting in each of them. Mana stone collector plates. Frequency. Channel. Broadcast. It was the first time she heard all of those words. That's amazing. Can I listen to the horseback battles relay with this? Its price was over 5,000 illness, and it only had about a year of life, but it was like an exclusive property of the bourgeois. Still, these days, imperial media companies were beginning to open their own channels. Yes. You can listen to it without having to buy a ticket. You can't watch it, though. The puppy, raised by the Empire citizens together, on Julie's lap looked at it in admiration as well. Knock, knock, the door opened, revealing D. Cullane's direct secretary, Wren, who just returned from a business trip. Night Julie. You have a schedule now. Oh, okay. Julie quickly refined her outfit and prepared for her mission. Her armor was her casual wear, so she didn't need to change into something else. The sun was already at its peak when I arrived in Haiti Kane. 
The first on today's schedule was the cutting ceremony of the underground passage. How did you think of a train passage that runs underground? Ha ha ha. I can't help but always admire Professor D. Cullane's discernment. Many people had already gathered at the entrance to the underground passage, all of them renowned in the business world. I welcomed them with Uriel. The underground passage was D. Cullane's idea, but it was my idea to build a shopping district. Uriel smiled calmly, her hands on her chest. The chatter stopped. Everyone glanced at me and held their breaths. That's right, I answered with a smile of my own. I see. As expected from Professor D. Cullane's sister. Right, that brightness comes from the genes of the family. That's right. This event was by no means simply social in nature. It was also political, which was made evident by their suspicions about my relationship with Uriel. Now, then. Let's start the cutting ceremony Uriel hesitantly held a pair of scissors. We all watched her cut the tape at the entrance of the passageway. Clap 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 clap. Its opening was welcomed with cheers and applause. They requested for me to go through the passage together with them, but I shook my head. The rest was up to her. I'm quite busy today, unfortunately. Uriel will provide you with more information regarding this business. It's under her jurisdiction anyway. Now, if you'll excuse me. Oh, really? That's a shame. Have fun in Haiti Kane. They looked a bit sad since they looked forward to me staying, but they still rode along the tracks with Uriel. Let's go back. Okay. As Julie and I made our way to the parking lot, Julie noticed someone following us and immediately blocked her. Stop. Reveal your identity before you come any closer. Her tone was heavy, but the mysterious woman remained undaunted as she answered. I'm an investor. She was wearing a suit and a beret. Confirming who she was, I dismissed Julie's worries. It's okay. You can stay inside. What? I have to talk to her privately, so leave. Oh, all right. Julie hesitantly got in the car, but she looked at us from the window. Your head seems to be okay, Arlo said. Al. Did you invest in this project? Al? Oh. You met me. Yes. It seemed like a good place to invest in. Arlo shrugged, then began to provide me with information. Zukakin and the altar still haven't given up on you. They probably have many plans in mind. Be careful. Hmm. And Garrick? Garrick was quite important. Insane named characters were given special treatment in the game. Since they were difficult to deal with, their combat power could be used as a strategic weapon by making it exponentially explode all at once. Garrick will be off the grid for a while. Anyway, the altar is preparing for an attack. That's why I came here. I frowned. Arlos glanced sideways, covering more of her face with her beret. An attack? I don't know the details. They're trying to move on their own now, so I don't have much intel. However, based on their personalities alone, they'll cause something huge. And the reason being? They're not your run-of-the-mill crazy individuals. No one can understand their insanity-driven minds. Just remember to be alert when you're somewhere crowded. A system message popped in front of me. Sudden event. Storm. You could have said that through a crystal ball. This is safer. After finishing what she had to say, Arlos immediately left. I got into the car after watching her disappear like a shadow. Let's go to the tower. The second thing on my to-do list was a project inspection. Yes. As Ren stepped on the accelerator, I felt a burning gaze coming from the seat next to me. Glancing sideways, I found Julie staring at me with a rather sullen face. Who was she? When our eyes met, she immediately raised a question she seemingly had been dying to ask. You don't need to know. Julie pouted and sat upright. She answered, I won't ask because you said I don't need to know, but her sharp gaze continued to glare ahead. Luina worked on her magic project in the lab. With it fully funded, the students who had been with her in her past workplace were sent to her. The Kingdom University Tower was reluctant about this project due to financial problems, but the Planning and Financial Coordination Office heads, authorized, stamp exerted tremendous power. After she submitted her plan, everything that she had requested was prepared within a week. Naturally, because of that, gossip circulated about her these days. 
she heard rumors along the lines of Luina became D. Colain's servant, and no, she's gone beyond that. She became a loyal dog, but she didn't bother denying any of them. Her feelings toward D. Colain had already eased to some extent anyway. Now, everyone, there's no need to desperately save mana stones. We're not in the kingdom anymore. Use them to your heart's content. As she encouraged them, the door to the lab opened, the identity of the person standing beyond it startled her. Professor D. Colain? What happened? Emergency inspection. It's part of my job as the executive director. D. Colain looked at the table and the sixteen wizards, who bowed to him, in the lab. Luina stood next to him, crossing her arms. There's nothing to worry about. I've been preparing this idea for a long time now. We just couldn't execute it because we didn't have the funds, but now that we do, it will definitely pay off. Are you confident? Of course. However, the problem is this project's expenses. We asked for 10 million illness as our initial budget, but it can increase nearly 20 times that amount. She replied, deliberately inflating the numbers. 2 billion. D. Lane didn't even blink. Okay. He had no doubts about it. After checking their documents, he left. He displayed, as always, impeccable behavior. His perfectly fine appearance, for some reason, left Luina some mixed feelings. Sighing softly, she followed D. Colain. Um. After she called his attention, he stopped and looked at her. Here. She held out a candy-shaped container to him, which made his eyebrows furrow, seemingly finding her sudden gift absurd. This is Karina Candy, the specialty of McQueen's estate. It's only available in the summer and in very small amounts, so it's considered a precious item. It's a product of our estate's filial piety. So what? This small bucket is worth a thousand illness, you know? People line up to buy it even at a higher price, and reservations for it are pushed back three years. Even with Luina's PR, he didn't even think about receiving it. She forced it into his suit pocket. If you don't want it, your fiancé will love it. I'm sure. No one can hate this candy. When she mentioned Julie, D. Colain finally nodded. Luina smiled, took a step back, and waved at him. Bye. Okay. It's embarrassing, but I'll take it. He transferred it from his suit pocket to his inner pocket. Thirty minutes later, D. Colain looked at Julie as soon as he got back into the car. What? Though still pouting, she remained sharp. He took out Luina's gift in his pocket. Huh? As soon as she saw its brand, Julie's face changed. Like a puppy that found a snack, her body suddenly bent forward as she drooled. Her pupils, which had grown in size, followed its every movement as he swung it from side to side. D. Colain smiled at the amazing effect it had on her. Where did you get that? It looks delicious. It's Karina candy. Do you know about it? Of course. It's a candy that never melts, the dream candy for many of us since we were kids. Right. Opening the lid, he took one out, and Julie immediately put her hands together like a plate and held them out. After he placed it on her palms, she immediately popped it in her mouth. Chomp, chomp, chomp. Her chewing was filled with joy. How delicious was this candy? He smirked. Sometimes, if you do a good job, I'll give it to you as a reward. After her momentary surprise, Julie began to work on his all-around security detail more passionately than ever. The final exam season of the Imperial University. Exhausted yet still busy undergraduates, wizards, and knights alike littered the campus. It felt like the entire college was engulfed in something profound. Sylvia wasn't. She perfected today's test, yesterday's test, and most likely tomorrow's test as well. Her procession of perfect scores would probably go on forever. Hmm <laughs> hmm. Humming, she pulled out a piece of paper she had kept in her robes in her pocket. Application, D. Colain, she filled out this form last night. D. Colain said he wouldn't accept it, but the minimum requirement for a full professor examination was one year anyway. She wanted to learn from him, even if only for the remaining six months. She was also confident she could convince him. I'm here. Miss you came? When she returned to the mansion, the attendants greeted her with bright smiles, the change in their atmosphere puzzling her. For some reason, they seemed unctuous. You've already made friends, and you didn't even tell us, Miss Tilda. 
What are you talking about? A friend. Since when did she have friends? She never had one in her life. It didn't take long for her to find the reason behind their behavior in the living room. What's this? Someone who looked like a fairing was sleeping on the sofa. GRRR. When she took a closer look, she realized it really was her. She was sleeping, covered with a blanket. Grr. Unlike this morning, she looked so soft and clean. It made her think she had taken a shower here. Rude of fairing. Crossing her arms, she glared at her, reminding her of the conversation they had last time. So, the letter your sponsor sent you has a pattern identical to the one on this handkerchief? Yes. That's how I realized he was watching me. Too bad I couldn't see his face since I was crying so hard while watching the play. The fairing's handkerchief belonged to Professor D. Cullane. If so, it was highly probable he also sponsored her. Sylvia felt immensely irritated and stressed by that fact alone. Why was the professor taking care of her only? Was it because her father committed suicide? Was it really just for that reason? If he doesn't accept me as an assistant professor, I might reveal it to a fairing. Whatever it was. Grr. Uck. She grabbed a fairing's nose and bent it from side to side. Ag. A fairing woke up screaming, and Sylvia straight away wiped her hands. W what are you doing? Why are you in someone else's house? Still, I was sleeping. She tended to her reddened nose, which hurt so much she was in tears. She even thought it was bleeding but soon realized it had just become runny. Sylvia's eyes narrowed. Why did you come? Paper. I know the secret of this paper. A fairing's words caused an exclamation mark to pop in her head. What do you mean you know? Phew. Even with such humiliation. Anyway, look. Doesn't this look just like a simple piece of paper? But, while holding it, a fairing performed pure water elemental magic, drenching Sylvia's paper. You're dead, idiot a fairing. Enraged for a moment, Sylvia nearly strangled her, but the shape of the paper soon began to change bizarrely. A fairing smiled confidently and raised a finger. Paper is made out of wood, but isn't wood a combination of earth and water? The wet paper soon spread in all directions and assumed a three-dimensional map. It was too easy. Do you know where that place is? Sylvia nodded. It was the locale forest on the 40th floor, one of the university tower's special floors. The test site was written on this piece of paper. She looked at a fairing in a new light. While she was taking an exam, she was doing this. She did well turning her into her slave. He he. What do you think? Now, it's time you buy me that. A fairing laughed. What? You promised. Rohawk. Sylvia thought it was ridiculous. She promised to treat her during the exams, but she wanted a Rohawk yesterday, the day before, and today. Gosh. Let's all go together today. With the staff of your mansion. No. Sylvia shook her head, but the attendants, who had been watching them delightedly, suddenly raised their hands. We don't mind it since it's the request of the young lady's friend they smiled and changed their clothes, leaving Sylvia no choice. A promise was a promise, and it was true that a fairing solved the problem. Even Professor D. Cullane would at least do this. Okay. Great. After an hour. Princess Glytheon, the head of Iliade, visited Sylvia's empty mansion. He went in calling his daughter, but she was nowhere to be seen, let alone her attendants. Shrugging, he explored the building, only to find it completely empty. Did they all go out? He walked over to Sylvia's door and knocked on it. Sweetie. Are you there? No answer. No reaction. Hmm. Scratching the back of his neck, he slowly opened it, finding no one in her room but the panda doll looking at him from her bed. Well, it's the final exam. He just wanted to make her healthy food. Grumbling, Glytheon was about to leave when he found a document on his daughter's desk. Is it her report card? After checking for sounds coming from within the mansion, Glytheon sneaked up to her desk. Swish. Hmm. Glytheon was full of interest as he picked the paper up, but his expression slowly hardened the more he read through it. His appearance grew cold, but his emotions blazed like flames. Veins popped out on his hand as he unknowingly crumpled it. Application form, Dika Lane. I, Sylvia, would like to volunteer to study under Professor Dika Lane. 
I am the only one among 150 debutantes to receive the perfect score in Professor D. Cullane's midterm exam. Impossible. He returned it where he found it. Its crumpled part straightened once more as if nothing happened, unlike his expression, which remained dark and enraged. Volunteer to study under D. Cullane? He thought it didn't matter whether Sylvia had a crush on D. Cullane and yearned and cherished any feelings for him. It would be just a fleeting fever for her that would pass by and disappear once she had matured. However, she was an Iliade before she was Sylvia. Their family should never fall under the Eucline. Ha! Ah, Glytheon chuckled. He was trying to make her see and hear only the good things. The conflict between families. War. A wizard's life. He thought it was too early for her to see that cold and cruel world. Ha 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 ha. But it seemed the time had come. He couldn't just watch this unfold. The child of a lion serving under a mere wolf would forever remain a disgrace and dishonor to their family. The time had come to let Sylvia know about the intertwined and tough chain of bad ties in which each of them hated the other. Glytheon was now ready to take off his mask. Chapter 80, His Test, 1. Drip drip drip. A midsummer shower poured outside the restaurant where a fairing, depressed, nibbled on her food. Why does life sometimes go awry like this? I can't go back in time to fix this. If despair comes, one would think the hope to overcome it would swiftly follow afterward, but reality is never that easy. There can never be enough compensation for this much melancholy. She twirled her chopsticks around her food and eventually dropped them on the table. Teardrops were welling in her eyes. What's wrong? Isn't it delicious? Sylvia's maids, Lette and Endel, were flustered. The steak was delicious enough for them. She only likes a certain pig. Sylvia ate her meal nonchalantly. It didn't matter to her whether it was rice balls, fried rice, pigs, or cows. Why? Why did it have to be today? A fairy murmured, her misery caused by the pig's flower s decision to not open today. She thought about the reason behind it as hard as she possibly could but nevertheless couldn't figure it out. In the end, she decided to ask Julia about it later. Stupid affairing. Sylvia stood up. Her lips curved upward, finding the evening quite satisfying. She didn't have the strength to respond. One of the three maids left the shop with Sylvia, and the other two remained behind. They sat and talked to affairing, who looked exhausted. This is a first. What? My lady's never brought a friend over before since her mother passed away. Ah! Affairin smiled bitterly. The truth was, Sylvia was so famous that most information about her and her family was public. Hence, people from the tower and even ordinary undergraduate students at the university knew that Sylvia's mother had passed away. Such was the problem that accompanied fame. So, you don't know how happy I was when Ms. Affairin came. You even willingly went all the way to the mansion. Aha ha! It was indeed voluntary, but. She was actually just hanging around its vicinity when she was dragged inside because she looked conspicuous. After that, the attendants treated her so well that she even took a shower without realizing it. No, really, this is the first time. Everyone finds the lady difficult to handle, but she even twisted your nose. That's never happened before. Uh, is that so? Of course that's why we were wondering if. You could continue being friends with Lady Sylvia in the future as well? It was hard for a fairing to answer that request. They weren't aware of it, but the relationship between Iliade and Luna couldn't even be considered good. Can't you? What? No, no, we should get along well, of course. Grinning, a fairing picked up her fork and knife and started eating the steak again. Sylvia came back home before the evening grew too deep since she had a lot to prepare. D. Cullane's test was already next Friday, after all. There was also her application, which she deemed in need of revisions. Daughter. However, in the middle of the mansion's unlit living room, an unexpected guest was waiting for her. Glytheon. Oh. My lord, when did you? Let A. Go outside. It was a rather cold atmosphere. Even the air itself felt heavy. Ah. Okay. I understand. Lette was worried but soon went outside, leaving the young lady behind. Sylvia approached him and tilted her head. What's the problem? 
Glithion tapped the application form on the desk silently, causing Sylvia's eyes to widen. Why did you look at it without my consent? She rushed to take it, but her hard-faced father blocked her. Are you really thinking of applying to be under D. Cullain's command? Yes. Only for six months. Glithion clenched his jaw as he stared at his younger daughter, who looked exactly like his deceased wife. Sylvia. I had hoped you would grow up only listening and seeing the good of the world, unlike me. His gaze moved to his wife's picture frame at the corner of the living room. She passed away a long time ago, but Sierra's smile remained radiant in the photo. The conflict between the magic families. The providence of the cold-blooded beasts known as wizards. I thought it was too early for you to learn of such a world. Glithion's expression slowly collapsed. He wasn't acting. Even though he sometimes did, he couldn't suppress the emotions currently flaring up within him. What do you mean? Do you know about the history between the Euclines and the Iliades, Sylvia? Do you know of our ill-fated relationship with them? She didn't answer. Having taken off his usual mask, he became unfamiliar, which scared her. He thoughtlessly stared at her as she took a step back. Sierra. The name of her mother, the person she loved the most in the world, caused her shoulders to faintly tremble. She was a beautiful woman and a good mother. I was undeserving of her. He stood up and approached her. Grabbing her shoulders to prevent her from running away, he looked into her eyes. Listen carefully, Sylvia. Though he looked like he was chewing something, he continued speaking clearly. Your mother was. Was killed by the Eucline. Her eyes widened slowly, her father's fury forming on her growing pupils. At that moment, her world felt as if it was moving away from her, abandoning her. Sylvia couldn't hear anything but the fearful beating of her heart. Glithion no longer seemed like himself. Rather, he looked more like a raging flame. D. Cullain killed Sierra. Those words brought her back to her senses, reminding her she was no longer a child. She shouldn't be paralyzed by fear. Our families have that kind of relationship. You should know that. Liar. He stopped talking, realizing there was already some faith inside Sylvia's mind. She pushed away his hand that grabbed her, causing his expression to distort. I know. I know the reason why mom left her hometown. What? Mom hated dad. Sylvia. But dad lied then, too. Glithion smiled hopelessly. D. Cullain's face came up in his mind, looking like he was the only noble of any importance as he looked down on the world itself. And the Euclid before D. Cullain, that fucking cunning serpent. Their whole family incited his fury. I'll ask him myself. Her tone was gelid. He can't claim my words to be false. He looked at Sylvia, who grew suspicious of him. She stared at her own father like something was wrong with him. Like Sierra did before. After you've asked him yourself, you'd know how stupid you've been. He tore Sylvia's application apart as he roared. Up until now, he had never shown this side of his to his child. Shocked, Sylvia bit her lips. Once you feel it in your heart, you'll know. He then left the mansion, opening the front door, seemingly with the intention of breaking it. The restless servants outside could only bow to him. Glithion ignored them and went straight to his car. It'll be all right. A small voice flowed in from a crystal ball in his possession. Breathing deeply, he replied, I let my guard down. No matter how peaceful the times are, I should have honed her character harshly. Isn't that too cruel an education, brother? She's still a child. It would be difficult for her. Ha! Huh. He thought about his past. At only seven years old, he almost became a tiger's meal, and when he was thirteen, he was coerced to kill his best friend. At twenty, he went to war and lost his mother. If you can't overcome that much, you're not an Iliade. Glithion didn't blame his fate. Instead, he considered hardship and suffering were the Iliade's essence. Their ambition was a rage that engulfed their entire lives like firewood incinerated by hellfire. You don't have to worry. Sylvia won't disappoint me. Even if she makes a mistake once, she'd eventually soar again. Just like that, the anger in Glithion's eyes slowly subsided. Friday, early morning. Ku Wung yawning, Efering went out of the dormitory. She had now completed most of her exams, including mandatory subjects such as, Destruction Series Utilization, and, 
assistance series transition, and even liberal arts subjects such as the, history of the empire, and, pursuit of a crime. As far as she knew, she perfected all of them. The only one left was D. Cullane's, understanding pure elements. It's the most important of them all. The final exam for a five-credit class. She couldn't even put the value of it into words. I shouldn't screw this one up. Even if I get A plus on three other tests, it wouldn't be enough to cover up for such a demerit. For the Solda exam and the professor's recommendation, I have to at least get second place. Solidifying her determination, she saw yellow hair in the distance. No, yellow felt lackluster and insufficient to describe its elegance. Sylvia's hair was that special. Its sparkle was a mixture between pure gold and sunlight, its luster flowing naturally like a waterfall. The Iliade's blonde hair, one of their symbols, was the most beautiful in the world. Men and women of all ages envied them for it. Sylvia. A fairing called her name as she approached her. Sylvia flinched, her face showing her usual disdain. Today. Huh? What's wrong with your face? Sylvia's current look startled her. She was haggard. Dark circles enveloped her eyes, and her cheeks were hollow. Did you do poorly on the exams? No, it's not that. You got a perfect score on everything. The rumors are already going around. She silently brushed past the dubious affairing, but she continued to tailor. 40th floor, right? They rode the elevator together, with affairing pressing the button for the 40th floor. Even then, she didn't say anything. Are you ignoring me? This upsets me. You're not even going to say, arrogant affairine? She pouted in disappointment. Every tenth floor of the tower was known as special floors. They were normally off-limits to debutantes. Among them, the fortieth floor was an artificially made natural landscape called Locale Forest. Ding! The door of the elevator opened, the scene catching them by surprise. Before them was a forest that stretched as far as they could see. Its vegetation gave off a fresh color, and the broad sunlight shone down on it brilliantly. Wow! So this is a special floor. The two stepped inside the forest. After some walking, they could see the debutantes. Among them were nobles like Lucia, Beck, and Jupern and the members of the commoners' club. Iffy. Julia. A fairy ran and hugged her subconsciously. The nobles stared at them, but they paid them no mind. You discovered it too. Julia. Yeah. I barely did, though. It took me about. Two weeks, I think? As they exchanged conversations, Ifering glanced at Sylvia. She looked like nobody in this space interested her. Nice to meet you. Startled by the familiar voice, the debutantes straightened their postures. On top of the forest hill, D. Lane looked down at them. Congratulations to the 117 debutantes here for finding the examination ground. Sylvia's vacant gaze on him caused a fairing to shake her head with a bitter smile. The theme of today's test is the fusion of theory and intuition. That theme was difficult no matter what angle they looked at it. The wizard swiftly became nervous, but they maintained their focus. I've said this before, and I'll repeat it as many times as I have too. Without theory, intuition wavers, and without intuition, theory is just an empty shell. Decalane cast, ductility, creating a luxurious chair out of a mixture of soil and wood. His magic never ceased to amaze their beholders, no matter how many times they witnessed it. In this forest, magical disasters capable of making your theoretical and intuitive skills tremble will occur from time to time. Your goal is to complete your tasks without wavering. Alan? D. Cullain sat on a chair after providing instructions, at which point his assistant professor appeared. He was smiling as always, but he somehow looked exhausted. Okay, everyone, take your test papers tilde. 1. Manifest and seal the three spells recorded below by order. 2. Gather and seal the eight attributes of pure elements. 3. Describe the mana phenomenon that you have observed in the locale forest. 4. Interpret and manifest the following mana catastrophe. 5. Demonstrate the reactivity of the following pure elements in this place. A total of five questions. The fairing sighed as soon as she saw it. The other wizards reacted no differently from her. However, mental management was more essential at times like this. What she found difficult was also difficult for others. 
she needed to adhere to that mindset now more than ever. Some magic may need materials to manifest, but you can get all of the requirements here. Be careful, however. The locale forest is a special floor. They're labeled as such due to the dangers they possess. What about the time limit for the test? Afarin asked. Aku. Alan sneezed once before answering. Ah, excuse me. Anyway, there's no time limit. Moreover, if danger arises, ask head professor D. Cullane for help Tilda. He then hopped up the hill, spread a piece of cloth beside D. Cullane, and modestly sat down on it. Professor would you like a cup of tea? Afarin heard a somewhat tiny voice asking. Sylvia, sitting by the riverbank, glanced at the head professor on top of the hill. He was reading a book as always. D. Cullane killed Sierra. Glytheon's words played back in her ears endlessly. Every time she looked at D. Cullane, her father's rage-filled expression overlapped with his image. Sylvia shook her head. A lie. I'm sure it's a lie. Sylvia repeated that line in her head over and over again. Perhaps the Iliades and Euclid's bad relationship was true, but the rest had to be a lie. Her father always exaggerated and fooled her anyway. Test. Focusing on the test, she crouched down and looked at the questions. Tack. A cold pain soon hit her head, however. Ah. Applying pressure to the painful section on her head, she looked up, finding hail pouring from the sky. She quickly built a tent to counter it. 1. Manifest and seal the three spells recorded below by order. She began to solve the first problem earnestly. Manifest and seal the three spells. It wasn't difficult. However, I'll ask him myself. He can't claim my words to be false. My head hurts. Sylvia tearfully murmured as she caressed her head. Her conversation with her father refused to go away. D. Lane, her muse, was within her sights, albeit standing afar. The one she yearned for. Perhaps even liked. Her father told her he killed her mother. Why? That's right. You got a perfect score this time again, Sylvia. Sylvia nodded despite her troublesome thoughts, deciding to ask him after hearing those words from him at the end of the test. At that point, she thought he would definitely say it was a lie, allowing her to tell Glytheon that there was a misunderstanding. I can do this. Making up her mind, she resumed answering the first problem. It was too easy for someone of Sylvia's caliber, but only five minutes later, she realized that she missed a crucial point. Ah. 1. Manifest and seal the three spells recorded below by order. Contrary to the instruction, Sylvia fused the three spells. Ironically, that mistake was due to her talent and mana being too brilliant. The reaction of three mid-scale magic being merged abruptly was obvious. No, pa a a Her spell, a combination of the wind and water elements, released a powerful and magical water torrent that immediately swept her away, giving her no time to escape. Comment below. What's your favorite part of the chapter?